Okie dokie. So today we are going to talk about neoplasia and I thought I'd record it on YouTube just so you can go back and reference it. If uh, during the recording you hear any Darth Vader sounds, it's my cat Piper. She has chronic upper respiratory problems. So you might hear that in the background and it's obnoxious, so just uh, try to ignore it. So, neoplasia. Let's just... Oops. There you go. Definition. So neoplasia means the formation of a neoplasm. A neoplasm can be a tumor, any new and abnormal growth, specifically one in which cell multiplication is uncontrolled and progressive. Neoplasms can be benign or malignant. When we're talking about a benign neoplasm, it's an unusual growth of cells that doesn't destroy the surrounding tissue. Okay, that's really the key factor with the benign. It doesn't, it might, it doesn't invade and destroy surrounding tissue. It can impair tissue function just by being there. So if you think about a uh, benign cutaneous lesion, uh, even if we think about a benign lipoma, so a lipoma in itself isn't going to continue to invade surrounding tissue. It's not going to take over surrounding tissue. It won't go into the lymph nodes or anything like that. That would impair the entire body function. But the fact that you have a nine and a half kilo or nine and a half pound lipoma sitting over your jugular, like that one I was telling you about in class previously, that can actually impair the function of the jugular, of the trachea, and that can essentially become life-threatening for that animal. But it's benign, so it won't spread. It won't metastasize. It can get bigger, but it won't take over and destroy surrounding tissue. Malignant, on the other hand, that's when the cells are, they display uncontrolled growth, okay, similar to that of benign, but they're capable of destroying local tissue. So these are the cells that won't just stick to a small tumor, but rather will continue to destroy surrounding tissue. Maybe they'll invade lymph nodes, maybe they'll get into the bloodstream, or maybe they'll spread throughout the visceral cavity. I think each of that's going to depend on what type of tumor it is, specifically and where it is in the body. So metastasis is how cancer cells spread from the site of the primary tumor into secondary locations. This little slide, is it cancer? It's just to sort of uh, confirm our understanding of what cancer means. As people, I find that we tend to throw around the term cancer. Not that we throw it around, but we use it quite often in varying situations. So we generally talk about all lymphomas as a cancer, all um, melanomas as a form of cancer. And in essence, they, they may be. But cancer is an umbrella word that refers to both benign and malignant tumors. So don't get them confused. If I say cancer, don't automatically refer to that being uh, malignant, where it's going to continue to spread. I always think back to the word cancer, and we think about skin cancer, whereas people, or with, sorry, people, we can have a basal cell carcinoma. So one that, yes, could be considered a malignant cancer, but at the same time it won't spread, or we can have um, benign skin cancers that stay in one spot, might be a mole that changes, but unlike the severe malignant skin cancers, it's not going to then creep into other systems, other organs, um, this other bones, etc. Some skin cancers are really scary and they will move on to bone tissue, which eventually kills you. That's it, that's a side, side note. Um, and cancer, again, we're going to, in the next lecture, get into hyperplasia, so an excessive growth of normal cells. When I'm talking about malignant and benign cancers or malignant and benign tumors, we're generally talking about cells that shouldn't be in an abundance in general, so cells that aren't normally present in an area. Looking at our cytology, our samples that we, we often take, we can take fine needle aspirates, mostly from cutaneous tissue masses, as well as lymph nodes. And bone marrow aspirates can be taken uh, when blood cell abnormalities are seen in peripheral blood.
but most samples we tend to take for cytological purposes or fine needle aspirates. And then if we suspect any malignancy or a benign tumor that needs to be removed, we might confirm it then, well, if it's suspected to be malignant, we'll definitely confirm it with histo histopathology. So physically taking a, a sample excised from an organ or from a, a tissue and sending it away for histo. For, we talked about this earlier in the year, but we'll just go over it again. So sample collections, fine needle bios, op, bleh, biopsy, aspirate, and non-aspirate. They're best for cutaneous and soft tissue masses, as well as lymph nodes. Biopsies are best for cutaneous and soft tissue masses. So it's kind of repetitive. <laughs> and bone marrow aspirate or bone marrow core are best when using peripheral, or sorry, when peripheral blood is also showing um, abnormalities, so when we suspect abnormalities. So what I was trying to say with this specific slide is that we tend to generally use fine needle biopsies and biopsies, so physical biopsies using the, the biopsy punch or a scalpel blade, rather than doing a skin scraping or an impression smear, because as we know with those, you're most likely just going to identify secondary bacterial inf or inflammatory reaction. Okay, so that's the fine needle aspirate of a lymph node. That would probably, I believe that's the mandibular lymph node on a dog. Looking at it the way I see it with the collar over here. So mandibular, which is quite enlarged. And again, you know, you don't want to jump to conclusions that if an animal has a swollen lymph node, it automatically means some sort of horrible cancer. They can get swollen lymph nodes for various reasons, whether it be a localized infection or uh, cats get them with upper respiratory infections. They get swollen mandibular lymph nodes. But in the case where you do have a swollen lymph node, if it's continued or progressive, then we might do a fine needle aspirate to find out what's going on. Bone marrow aspirate. I believe that this is a topic in a group project, so I won't go ahead, but that's from um, likely a pelvic uh, bone marrow aspirate, and that's a sterile aseptic procedure, totally aseptic procedure. As with any cytological sample, as soon as you take your sample, it's best to process in it immediately. You, that means putting it on the slide, choosing your preparation, and going ahead and doing that. Now, if you can't tell what your sample will reveal, in the sense that if you're unsure if it has um, a high rate of exfoliation, so lots of cells present or low, then you might want to make a few different smear preparations just to ensure that you know, you're taking this valuable sample from the animal. You may have needed sedation or anesthetic to get it, try some various, uh, a few different smear preparations to find out which one worked best. If you're handling fluids, you might need to concentrate your cells, so centrifugation um, for a sediment smear, or you can do a buffy coat smear, depending on what sample you're taking. And if it looks like a sample that has low cellularity, then a line smear would be best. Now, just a, a quick note, if I ever use the term exfoliation, it does not refer to <laughs> taking the skin off your face or using a pumice stone, but rather exfoliation refers to the rate at which the cells um, come off the initial source. So if we think about our skin cells, they're constantly exfoliating, they're constantly flaking off. Skin cells, epithelial cells, have a really high rate of exfoliation. So any sort of epithelial type tumor, you'll tend to acquire more cells on your slide than you would, say, with a spindle tumor, which has low rates of exfoliation. Here's your line smear. So with your stains, um, Depending on what it is that you're looking at, most often we tend to just use the Romanowski type stains, which is our HEMA3 or our DIFQUIC. Just a quick note, the DIFQUIC doesn't work very well for a suspected mast cell tumor, so keep that in mind if, if it is one that you suspect a mast cell tumor. Rate stains are a little bit better for mast cell tumors. Fixative and stain is in one product. Eumethylene blue, great for mast cell tumors. And then if we think back to our stain slide, which type of stain would most likely to be used in the lab for nucleoli definition? I'll let you answer that in your own heads, because I know you can't answer. <laughs> 
All right, so histopathology, as we know, gives us an idea of the entire picture of what's going on. It tells us about not only those cells that we're seeing specifically on a tumor, but the way those cells are interacting with the surrounding territory, with the surrounding tissue. So I always think about it, you can see the whole city rather than just the neighborhood, or the whole city instead of just one suburb. Whereas if we take a little fine needle aspirate with just cytology, then we're getting a snapshot of those specific cells in that specific area. So just always keep in mind that it's pretty rare that we will, and we as RVTs, we don't diagnose, but we provide information that leads to a diagnosis. But it's pretty rare for any sort of tumor to be fully diagnosed based on a fine needle aspirate. I think the one exception that we tend to use in clinic is the lipoma, where you spray a lipoma on a slide, most clinics just start to stain it and realize that the fat has melted off with the fixative, or you rinse it and it just looks like fat beads dribbling off. And that's sort of the, the typical way we'll use a fine needle to diagnose. But most often, and really the, the highest standard of practice would be to take a fine needle aspirate. If you see something that looks suspicious of a malignancy, um, or you know even inflammation or whatnot, but if you see something that looks suspicious, then you go back, take a biopsy, and send it away for histopathology to see exactly what's going on, not only with those cells, again, but with the surrounding tissue. Uh, results aren't as immediate with cytology. Again, they ha with histopathology, they slice the sample into tiny, tiny cellular layers, coat it in wax, and view it under a high-tech microscope. And the histopathology is what really determines the treatment and prognosis. A lot of times we use uh, histopathology along with cytology and clinical signs to determine what grade or what stage the cancer is at, if it is a cancer or a malignancy. So all those components together can tell us what's going on. So let's go back to our little algorithm here. So we've talked about, uh, so we've decided that our sample is abnormal. Okay, the first one that we've talked about is infection, and then subclassify infection as parasitic, fungal, or bacterial. If it's not infection, then we have to look at inflammatory. So do we have white blood cells present in abundance? If yes, then again, we subclassify as neutrophilic, sorry, purulent is the term that I'd like to see, uh, mixed, which is pyogranulomatous, and then granulomatous, eosinophilic, hey, get back here. Or lymphocytic and we subclassify that. So we've covered those two quite happily. We're moving on to neoplastic and then finally we'll touch on the non-inflammatory non-neoplastic. So when we have a neoplastic sample, really what I'm looking for you, the whole purpose of this course, the whole end result is to know what's out there in the way of cytological findings, what's common in practice, what are you going to see, what uh, prognosis would that have for the client, the patient? But I'd like to be able to, at the end of the semester, give you a slide, tell you what the lesion looked like, where it came from on the animal, maybe their clinical history with that, and ask you to fully classify the sample. So thinking about inflammatory, you're already there. Hopefully, you're already there. You're able to do that. Infection, you're able to do that. If I hand you a slide from a mass, and it doesn't fit the inflammatory, it doesn't fit the infection, then we have to look to see if it looks like a non, an NNNI, which is non-inflammatory, uh, non non-neoplastic, sorry, yeah, <laughs> that category, or if it's neoplastic. If it's neoplastic, my expectation is that you'd be able to tell me if it looks like an epithelial cell tumor, a round cell tumor, or a mesenchymal cell tumor, and give me the reasons why. And then subsequently, if there is criteria of malignancy present. So we'll talk about the criteria of malignancy at the very end of this uh, PowerPoint. So we have three tumor types that we'll talk about. Epithelial cell tumors, round cell tumors, which are also called discrete cell tumors, as well, and then we have spindle cell tumors, also called mesenchymal cell tumors. And I believe you have this in Blackboard as well, so just to print out. It's good to know this chart. That's a big hint. Good to know general cell size, general cell shape, 
generally knowing what they look like is ideal. And then the cellularity. So the cellularity refers to also the uh, exfoliation. So is there high exfoliation, is there low, uh, or is there medium exfoliation? So what would you expect to see in that sample? If it's a spindle cell tumor, you wouldn't expect to see a lot of cells. Uh, if it's a normal spindle cell tumor or normal spindle cell tissue, if it's epithelial cell, you tend to get clumping and clusters. But we'll, we'll go into that in lab, so don't worry about that right this second. We'll start with epithelial cell tumors. These tumors involve the skin itself, glands in the skin, or the hair follicles. They tend to be round in shape, and the cells are attached to one another in sheets or clumps. Nuclei are round to oval in shape and the cells have a distinct cytoplasmic border. This would include papillomas, squamous cell carcinomas, basal cell tumors, sebaceous gland tumors, sweat gland tumors, perianal tumors, and transitional cell tumors, carcinomas. It's not uncommon to see a variation in the size of the nucleus and the nucleus to cytoplasm ratio in epithelial cells and epithelial cells tumor, cell tumors. Sorry. If we think back to vaginal cytology, looking at those cells, they start off as really nice, tiny little round cells, those happy little parabasal cells that I swear they do exist, okay? I know they're hard to find, but they do exist. So epithelial cells start, technically they start as basal cells. So we see that in some samples, we won't see it in all. And what they are, they have a high nucleus to cytoplasm ratio, they're really round, their nucleus is really round, their cytoplasm is really round and the cytoplasm is fairly tight to the nucleus. As epithelial cells age, we know that their nucleus starts to become more pycnotic and their cytoplasm becomes more expansive. So with epithelial cells and epithelial cell tumors, it's not uncommon to see a variance in the nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, as well as the size of the cells themselves. Keep that in mind as we start to talk about criteria of malignancy. Now this isn't the best picture I realize now as I'm presenting it, but the main thing to get from this one, maybe you'll have to hold your computer about 20 feet away from you so that it's not blurry, but these are epithelial cells along with some neutrophils kicking around, and note that they have a distinct cytoplasmic border. Okay, As they start to become older and we think about our squamous cells and we think about our superficial cells or anuclear cells, that cytoplasmic border becomes less distinct. That's normal for squamous cells, or sorry, for epithelial cells. But generally, in most stages of the epithelium, they have distinct cytoplasmic borders. Okay, you can see that fanning out there. You'd be able to draw a line around that cytoplasm. And you can see within this sample that variance in the nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio as well as the size of the cells themselves. Okay, this is a malignant sample and it's an epithelial tumor. So let's go back one. Have a look at this. Again, we're seeing, you know, variance in the size of the nuclei, variance in the size of the cells. The cells are clumped and that's normal for epithelial cells. We get into this one and we're seeing it doesn't quite make sense to me thinking about epithelial cells. So we know with epithelial cells, as they start to get older, then their cytoplasm gets, starts to get quite a bit bigger and their nucleus starts to shrink. So then I start to think about looking at this sample right away, it doesn't look normal to me. I have red blood cells in the background so I get, can get an idea of how big these cells actually are. We have clumping in sheets of epithelial cells. That's normal, that's okay. And we've got distinct cytoplasmic borders. You could draw a line around that. Okay, that's normal. But then we have these giant cells here, and they also have a giant nucleus. Whereas a normal epithelial cell, as it gets older, it gets bigger for sure, but the nucleus should be shrinking and the cytoplasm should be getting larger. So these cells are quite big. So we have uh, significant anisocytosis but also they have a significant size nucleus. Okay, just keep that in mind. So right away looking at it, it doesn't fit the mold for how um, uh, epithelial cells age and how, you know, why would they be that big with that big of a nucleus? So this is a malignant sample. And again, we'll talk about criteria malignancy later on in the PowerPoint. 
And just to point out too, we have all these interesting little nucleoli present within the cells. Not normal for uh, epithelial cells. Here's another one. So this is another malignant epithelial tumor. So again, we've got our normal qualities of the epithelial cells. We have distinct cytoplasmic borders. Okay, you could draw a line around it. Happy cytoplasm. Okay, you could draw a line. But then again, something just doesn't look normal. Yes, the staining is very basophilic. But look at how... Okay, let's focus on this cell here. Good cytoplasmic borders. I'm happy with that. What the heck is going on with that nucleus? That's a mitotic change. So that's abnormal mitosis. Uh, and I would use my hints to explain this to you guys, which I will do in class. But normally the chromatin starts in the middle and it separates to either side of the cell before the cell divides. This one, it just didn't know what to do, so it just starts to crumble. The chromatin goes all over the place, and that's a pretty good characteristic of a malignant cell. This one, we have multinucleation, which is abnormal for epithelial cells. And look at all these nucleoli. And look at the differences in size of the nucleoli. We have some really big nucleoli and some really tiny nucleoli. Again, we have some normal characteristics. Okay, well-defined cytoplasm, clumping in sheets of epithelial cells, totally normal. But then we have these abnormal characteristics for epithelial cells. Here's another malignant. Okay, again, well-defined cytoplasmic borders. You can see the end of the cell. And then you have all these abnormal mitotic changes, so abnormal mitosis. It just doesn't look nice. It doesn't look... Thinking back to your vaginal swabs, the epithelial cells, even though they have a variation of size, they still maintain a neat uh, nucleus and cytoplasm. Okay. What I want you to do as we get on to these criteria of malignancy too, it's important just to start trusting yourself when you look at cells to see what looks normal and just what what gives you the gut feeling that something's not normal. Okay, why do these nuclei all look completely different? Why are these cells completely different shapes and sizes? It tends to give you a bit of a hint that something's just not happy. And my cats are attacking each other, so you might hear some screaming. Mesenchymal tumors. So these are the... Um, Connective tissue tumors and connective tissue cells. And I spelt tumors wrong. <laughs> Don't spell it like that. So these uh, cells, or sorry, these tumors, they start from cells that surround or support the skin. So that includes fat, connective tissue, blood vessels, and nerves. Cells of mesenchymal tumors often have poorly defined membranes. So often, not always, but they often have poorly defined cytoplasmic borders. Compare that to epithelial cells. Epithelial should have well-defined cytoplasmic borders. Cells are not usually round, unlike epithelial, as well as round cell tumors. So they can take on a whole bunch of different shapes, which is kind of neat and also kind of frustrating. But again, they just don't really look like, they don't, most often they don't look like any other type of cell that you'll see. So they tend to stand out and be unique in that sense, which is kind of nice. So they can have a spindle shape, which we see spindle cell tumors are really common. And they're often not, I mean, they can be benign or malignant. So some spindle cell tumors we can remove and the animal can be happy and live normally. Others are um, a sarcoma and that becomes malignant and will spread through the body. So there are spindle cells, which has a round to oval nucleus and then um, spindly thin uh, cytoplasm on either end. They can be polygonal and they can be dendritic. Oop, sorry, dendritic. Okay, with little fingerlings coming across. They, they're they more often loose, so they don't typically sheet or clump. Now again, jumping ahead to criteria of malignancy, if you see sheeting or clumping of these cells, then that's an abnormal representation for these mesenchymal tumors. And that might be something to consider as a criteria of malignancy. I'll give you an example of the um, exception to that rule. We looked at lipomas and lipocytes. They tend to stick together. Okay, They tend to be in sheets and clumps. It's not uncommon for lipomas. So examples of mesenchymal tumors are fibrosarcomas, hemangiomas, and hemangiosarcomas. Hemangioma is benign, hemangiosarcoma is malignant. 
Fibrosarcoma are based on the fibrocytes, so connective tissue cells. Lipomas are lipocytes. And hemangios, uh, hemangioma or hemangiosarcoma, those are tumors of the blood vessels. Okay, so the cells that actually make up the walls of the blood vessels. So you can see them anywhere in the body because we have blood vessels everywhere. And you also see them quite often on the spleen. So here's an example of a hemangiosarcoma. Okay, sorry, just going back to this. So these ones just happen to be vacuolated. They can be vacuolated or not. It depends on the type of specific cell and the origin of that cell. And these ones particularly, you can see nice round nucleus. This one has an oval nucleus. And they these just little thin wispy ends to their cytoplasm. So they don't have a well-defined cytoplasm. You'll find that they just wisp off. I think of them as little ghosts, uh, little ghost hands, just that kind of thing where they're almost see-through in the ends. This one, uh, these ones are my favorite, lipomas, so absolute favorite. And they tend to be in sheets. That's normal. And also contrary to what is common for mesenchymal tumors, lipomas have well-defined cytoplasmic borders. Whereas, going back to these guys, they don't. Okay, they're just wispy. Here's an osteosarcoma. So, um, th this just means um, malignant bone cancer. And osteosarcomas are the worst. <laughs> if your dog, I don't know, if any dog ever has an osteosarcoma, they're just the worst tumors that an animal could ever have because it literally eats away at the bone. It creates this giant growth on the bone that you can identify through x-ray and then the bone starts looking very moth-eaten and uh, bones will break quite readily when you have an osteosarcoma. So that's a spindle cell, okay, typical caudate or spindly type. And you can see there's no true cytoplasmic border. It just does what it wants. All right, round cells, also known as discrete cell tumors. Uh, examples of these are mast cell tumors, lymphoma, lymphosarcoma, histiocytomas, melanoma. Now, melanoma, I'm telling you, I've read so many different articles, and melanoma, melanocytes, have been put in round cells, they've been put in as mesenchymal cells, and they've been put in as epithelial cells. So their qualities, from what I understand, and their characteristics change over time as the cell develops. So Realistically, I should just put them in every single category. I don't fully believe, based on the research, that they're strictly uh, considered a round cell. They don't really fit the category of the round cell. But in the cytology book that we're using in class, they are considered a round cell. So just know that they're a little bit different. Plasmocytomas, which are, of course, related to lymphomas and sort of the, the lymphocyte in general, right? Plasma cells bounce back and forth. Uh, histiocytic neoplasia, transmissible venereal tumors, those are all round cells. Um, <laughs> yeah. Just, I mean, that's just a note about melanomas, and we're just going to, we've already gone into them of what they look like. So don't feel that you have to stick them into a specific category. Just know that in the research, they've been identified within all three categories of tumors, which is crazy. So with the round cells, their general shape is round, as the name would indicate. Their nucleus shape is round to oval. Um, histiocytes, which we'll talk about a little bit more, may have a regularly shaped nuclei. Cytoplasm characteristics, they may or may not have granules or vacuoles. And the presence of these granules or vacuoles can help indicate which type of tumor it is, so which specific cells you're seeing. Because, yeah, I spelled that right. Oh, again, I spelled tumors wrong. Sorry. Something shiny. Um, I got distracted. Oh, I forget. oh, yeah, sorry. So round cells, they look very, very similar to each other. Okay, so knowing which cells should have vacuoles, which cells should have granules, and sort of the frequency of the granules and the color of the granules, those are all small defining factors that can help differentiate from one round cell to the next. Not uncommon in clinic just to have a slide and identify that it's a round cell neoplasm. Okay, rather than specifically identifying it as, oh, I see histiocytes, or oh, that's definitely a venereal tumor. Okay, so round cell neoplasms, this is more or less what they look like. I don't know if you guys can hear that cat. It's disgusting. <laughs> 
Okay, this is a mast cell tumor, which we're all familiar with. And just to point out, that's a nuclei, nuclei, red blood cells. So the nuclei tend to stain a pale blue or a pale purple. But they are an example of a, a round cell. Mast cell tumors are generally considered to be malignant in the dog with the potential for widespread movement throughout the body. Okay, just a couple notes about mast cells. In the cat, if a cat has a single cutaneous mast cell tumor, so oftentimes we see them on the head in cats, one small mast cell tumor on the cat's head, often that's benign, and often that won't cause any problems in the future. However, in the cat, if they have more than one of those cutaneous mast cell tumors, so more than one of those small growths, whether it be on the head, the, the trunk, or the limbs, that tends to become, or sorry, that tends to be uh, diagnosed as malignant. Okay, so it's more likely to be malignant if they have more than one of those cutaneous growths. And what that means is with these specific cats that have more than one of these cutaneous mast cell tumors, a guarded prognosis is often given with a short median survival time. Okay, so they can be quite serious in the cat and dog. They're very common to see. We do see a lot of them that are a single, just uh, one single mast cell tumor that's removed and that's curative. But if it does, you know, if you're seeing recurrence of the mast cell tumors on these animals, or if they have more than one, a red light needs to be going off that that cat does not have a benign mast cell tumor, but rather a malignant one, same with the dog, that would continue to spread throughout the body. And eventually, you know, it will take over tissue and it, it can take over organs and kill the animal. So survival time with mast cell tumors, again, it's dependent on if it's benign or malignant, but just keeping in mind that they can be a really serious thing. Now with cats too, rather than dogs, cats we tend to also see the mast cell tumors in the visceral cavities, so attaching themselves to organs, uh, specifically the large intestine cats can get uh, mast cell tumors which have a very guarded prognosis and uh, they tend to not, not do particularly well with those. Oftentimes we find those when they're too late, again, like we talked about before, cats vomiting, diarrhea, and uh, turns out to be a malignant cancer. Mast cell tumors have their own grading system. Uh, we don't grade them as our VTs. We don't, but we should be aware of the grading system. And the grading is done based on histology, cytology, and clinical history, and uh, physical presentation of the mast cell tumor. So our grading system, it indicates the degree of malignancy. So how bad is it, and how likely is this going to spread, that it is going to spread? Grade 1 is well differentiated, moderate to poorly circumscribed, mild to moderate inf infiltration into deep dermal tissues, moderate mitotic index, potential slight cytomorph... Oh, I'm reading the wrong one. How embarrassing. Oh, my cats are driving me nuts. <laughs> okay, so grade 1. The ce so some of these components relate to the cells and some relate to the physical presentation of the mast cell tumor. So well-differentiated cells, okay, that's specific to cytology. Generally well-defined cells, um, also well-defined mass as well, so well-circumscribed edges, it's not mixing into other tissue. Superficial, so it's not uh, burrowing its way down past the cutaneous tissue. And low mitotic index, remember when we looked back at that abnormal mitosis of the cell? Well, when we're talking about mast cell tumors, they do look at the nuclei histologically and cytology and grade them based on the, the mitotic index, so how many of those cells have abnormal mito uh, mitosis. Grade 2, moderately well differentiated, moderate to poorly circumscribed. So that's the moderate to poorly circumscribed, that's referring to the edges of the mass itself. Mild to moderate infiltration into deep dermal tissues, mild or sorry, moderate mitotic index, and potential slight cytomorphological atypia. So that cytomorphological atypia that's talking to the criteria of malignancy on a cellular level that we'll talk about a little bit later in this lecture. Grade three is potentially poorly differentiated, so the cells aren't neat, they could be clumped, they could be in sheets. 
poorly circumscribed, so it looks like that mass itself is shifting. Kind of like a mole, when a mole changes shape, your doctor starts to get concerned. So if your mole is happy and round, that's generally not a problem. Same with mast cell tumors. If they're happy and round, that's good. You know, it's not a, a green light, but it is good. It's when they start invading other tissues, surrounding tissues, um, both laterally and horizontally, that's when it starts becoming an issue. Deep infiltration into subcutaneous tissue, potential high mitotic index, and potential moderate, moderate cytomorphological atypia. So you don't need to know too much about this. Main thing I want you to know about this is, I, I guess just a couple criteria for each as to how we would know that that's a really bad mast cell tumor that has potential for malignancy versus one that you know is very likely to be benign. And that goes hand in hand with if there's one cutaneous mast cell tumor versus three or four and the, the rate of malignancy with each. And also it's good to know grade one is you know more likely to be benign, grade three we're more likely to be malignant. Okay, transmissible venereal tumor is the next tumor that we'll talk about. Um, so this one's kind of cool. This is <laughs> this is my favorite tumor, the venereal tumor. Just sounds kind of weird. So this one is a unicellular asexual reproducing pathogen. So this is one of the very few, actually right now I believe it's the only infectious cancer that they know about. And it's common, or not common, but it it's most likely to affect dogs, and I believe it was lemurs was the other animal. I'm pretty sure it was lemurs. So this one, the cells are not a result of the virus, the way most transmissible venereal diseases would be, like STDs for animals. So it's not the result of the virus, but it's the cells. Hmm, it's not a result of the virus, and the cells do not belong to the original host. They are a multiplying cancer cell that basically says, tag, you're it, and jumps on to the next animal and continues reproduction. They're, they're really strange. So they're typically seen as a benign neoplasm, a benign neoplasia, but with a suppressed immune system. So in an animal that has whatever it may be suppressing their immune system, they can actually form a malignancy. And that malignancy can occur it can be transmitted, um, not transmitted, um, oh, I forget what I was going to say. Anyways, the malignant form of the transmissible venereal tumor is most often seen in the eye. So it's in the intraocular space, and it's a malignant version that can go on and invade other tissues, lymph nodes, etc. So most often these guys are benign. And if you remember from the AI presentation, the AI lecture, I had a picture of the transmissible venereal tumor. So it looks like a, a large ulcerative growth on either the penis or the vulva. But just to note that these are incredibly unique in that they're the only known infectious cancer. So a cancer that can jump from patient to patient to patient. And another thing to note is that these are most often found where wild dog populations are present and also where it's hot. So it tends to be tropical to subtropical areas in the cities where wild uh, dogs tend to, to roam. Treatment for these can be uh, chemotherapy and surgery. Surgery alone will lead to recurrence, can be difficult uh, to actually perform surgery considering where the lesions occur. All right, so carrying on, our next round cell tumor that we'll talk about are histiocytomas and generally just histiocytes. Histiocytes are a round cell tumor um, and they're sort of the more common round cell tumor that you'll see other than a lymphoma. Just a note, cats typically do not get histiocytomas or histiocytosis. They seem to be unaffected by this specific type of tumor. So histiocytes is what you're looking at here, okay? They're a typical round cell tumor, moderate uh, nuclear to cytoplasm ratio, fairly round in appearance. Some have oval nuclei, that's completely normal, but generally they're fairly round, tend to look like lymphocytes, 
Histiocytes tend to have more cytoplasm than lymphocytes and to be a little bit more purple, just slightly basophilic compared to that of a uh, lymphocyte. So your histiocytes are interesting little cells that can cause a whole bunch of different disorders. So we'll go through a couple different types of disorders just because I've noticed over the last few years I'm seeing more of these. And initially I thought all histiocytomas are benign, they're happy, you can remove them and it's fine. But there are different presentations of histiocytic lesions that we're going to talk about and each of them requires a different level of care and management. So the first histiocytic lesion we'll talk about is a histiocytoma. This is the one that removal is generally curative. It's a benign neoplasia, and it tends to be uh, it tends to present as a singular, well circumscribed, round raised lesion that's alopecic. It can be red, as this one is here, or it can be pale. They can look a lot like a mast cell tumor if they're red because okay, mast cell tumors tend to take on that appearance. It's a solitary lesion. It's common in younger dogs. And again, remo removal is curative. Okay, So these are benign. They typically won't recur if you take them off. Uh, this picture is a little bit fuzzy, but this one is the cutaneous histiocytosis. So it's a benign, another one that's benign. It's a neoplasia that results in numerous cutaneous lesions throughout the body. Spontaneous regression has been reported, so sometimes just leaving these to disappear on their own can happen. Uh, multiple, so the general appearance of these ones are multiple erythematous, erythematous, erythem, oh, red, <laughs> multiple red plaques, as you're seeing here. So plaques, little areas of perhaps excess growth of cells, so just sitting on top of each other rather than forming a large raised area. Alopecic, that's your typical plaque that you can see. Or they can be small raised bumps generalized throughout the body. Um, they vary in size from one to five centimeters in diameter, and they present in the dermis and in the adipose tissue. The plaques and the nodules can be alopecic or they can become ulcerated. Number of lesions varies from a few to over 50, and the lesions tend to wax and wane. So it's one of these strange occurrences where the dog might all of a sudden have a ton of lesions. They could have 50 lesions, and then with doing nothing to the patient, they could have one lesion the next week. Okay, so these histiocytic lesions, these cutaneous histo histiocytosis, can come and go on its own without any any treatment at all. The next is systemic histiocytosis. So it's a little bit more involved than the cutaneous histiocytosis. It works its way into deeper tissue and it's very common around the nose and it can burrow its way and uh, disintegrate the septum of the nose and all the mucosa of the nose. Very, very um, invasive. So it's much more invasive throughout the body. It may involve lymph nodes. Euthanasia used to be the common treatment for this one. More recent studies indicate that clinical management can work to alleviate the symptoms of the condition. So this isn't necessary. This is still benign. Okay, it's still considered benign. However, it's pretty severe and it is quite invasive. So just keeping in mind that if this is seen in your clinic, a lot of times euthanasia is a recommendation after, normally after um, weeks and weeks of trying to treat it. So with this one in particular, so with the systemic histiocytosis, there's marked tendency to involve the skin, the ocular and nasal mucosa, and peripheral lymph nodes, deeper involvement than that of the cutaneous histiocytosis, so it's much more severe. And it's most common in the Bernese Mountain Dog. Originally, it was thought to only be um, an abnormality of the Bernese Mountain Dog, but it's not. It can go into other breeds such as Great Dane, or not, yeah, Great Danes, Irish Wolfhounds, Dobermans, but it's most common in the Bernese Mountain Dog. The last one, which I don't have a picture of, is the histiocytic sarcoma complex. So the histiocytic sarcoma complex is the malignant version of the systemic histiocytosis. 
and it spreads past the peripheral lymph nodes. So the malignant version can spread into the peripheral lymph nodes and then further spread and multiply throughout the visceral organs as well. So this systemic histiocytosis would present in this manner, and typically you don't see this continuing past the peripheral lymph nodes. However, if it does, um, and it continues into the visceral organs, the intestines, the gut, etc., then we're looking more at a malignant version, okay? And that's the histiocy histiocytic sarcoma complex. How you would diagnose these uh, would be take a biopsy and send out for histop histopathology. You can do a fine needle aspirate of the affected area to start to identify it as a round cell tumor and perhaps as a histiocytoma, but furthermore, to find out, especially if it is that malignant version, you need to get on that fast before it starts to um, affect the internal organs. Now, <laughs> this one's my favorite. This happened to my parent's dog, Friggy. So, my parents' dog is a uh, Beagle Cocker Spaniel Cross, cute little thing, about 35 pounds. And they started telling me that she starts to look like a cartoon dog. And I came home one day and I looked at her and this poor dog had this giant, giant mass and it went past the cutaneous tissue. To touch it, it was firm. It felt almost as though there were bone, bone involvement because I couldn't feel the differentiation between the frontal bone of the skull or sorry, the nasal bone of the skull and the, the lesion itself. It felt as one big firm mass. And it would come, it would last for a few weeks, and then it would go. And it would come, and it would go. That coming and going, that waxing and waning, and sort of curing on its own, that is so typical of a histiocytic lesion. They don't know why immune involvement or immune suppression could have involvement with that, but... It's so typical for them just to come and go, come and go without any treatment. So what we did is we took a punch biopsy, we sedated her, we took x-rays first to see if there was any bone involvement, because realistically, if there was bone involvement, then either it's a severe inflammatory reaction, which would be horribly painful and it's eating away at the bone, that can happen, or it would be an osteosarcoma, right? A bone cancer that's developed on the nose and it's eating away at the skull, which of course I would say, okay, parents, sorry, but this is, you know, either do chemo or euthanize, but I, that's a different story. So we took an x-ray, there was no bone involvement. So we took a little punch biopsy, just right here, and we sent it away for histiopathology. And if you ever send anything to, is it, oh, who is it? Uh, Dr. Wilcox, Dr. Brian Wilcox. Histovet is who we sent it to. He sends you this beautiful long paragraph about what he found in his histopathology. So in the end, it ended up being a histiocytic type lesion, benign, and that was it. And he said there was no inflammatory involvement, there was no infectious agents, so basically let it go away on its own. It was a histiocytic lesion, there's no way to cure it. So all we did was the punch biopsy, we sutured it up, and it has never, ever come back again for whatever reason. And of course, my parents have all these crazy ideas as to what caused it. Oh, it was the chicken in her food. It was when you gave her that dental bone, etc. But realistically, it's just so characteristic of a benign histiocytic lesion. Okay, so moving on, we have naked nuclei. So the only reason this is in here is so that you know that if you're seeing naked nuclei, don't mistake them for round cells. Okay, don't mistake them for uh, a neoplasia, etc. Are they all they are is a cell missing its cytoplasm? Okay, so generally it's not a diagnostic reference for neoplasia. The appearance of the lack of cytoplasm is due to cell rupture because they are too fragile. So sometimes that means that the the tech or the vet was a little bit too abrupt in taking the sample or creating the smear. But there are certain cells where it's very, very common to see naked nuclei. These samples are typically very cellular, so high exfoliation of cells. So an example of a tumor that you would often see naked nuclei, regardless of how careful you are with the cells themselves, would be a thyroid tumor. Okay, those are naked nuclei. So all they are are quite big nuclei. No cytoplasm, even that, that I don't see a cytoplasmic border. That's an immature red blood cell in the middle. 
but those are all naked nuclei. And to explain that background, it looks like a really fine granular background or a proteinaceous background, just as an extra little tidbit. And that's a thyroid tumor. And you can see that some of them you can see is cytoplasm around them, but others, again, we've got those naked nuclei. So a couple uh, notes about the neoplasm name gain. The prefix of a tumor's name indicates the tissue of origin. So osteo, we know, refers to bone. Osteosarcoma is a bone tumor. Okay, you can, I know you can hear that cat crawling. <laughs> the suffix of a tumor's name usually indicates if it's benign or malignant. Oma, so just oma, not carcinoma, not sarcoma, but just oma, like a fibron, fibroma, means benign. Fibroma is specifically a benign tumor of the fibrous connective tissue, so it's fibrocytes, a benign tumor of fibrocytes. Sarcoma and carcinoma uh, refer to malignancies. Oops, sorry. Let's go back one. So carcinomas specifically refer to epithelial cell tumors. They arise from epithelial tissue. They spread through both the lymphatic system and the bloodstream. Regional lymph node and lung metastasis are common in carcinomas. Sarcomas refer to mesenchymal cell tumors. They spread through the bloodstream, and lymph node metastasis is rare. You can see it, okay? You can take a lymph node aspirate and see spindle cells, but it's incredibly rare. All right, so as we go through these slides, just try, I know you can't answer me, and it sounds silly when I ask you, but just think about what general tumor type you're looking at. So right off the hop, to me, those look like mast cells. Various sized mast cells, which probably is not a good sign about the cell, but those are mast cells, so we're looking at a round cell tumor. Here we have a very good picture of spindle cells. You can see they don't have nice cytoplasmic borders. You can't draw an end. You can't draw your, your borders around each of the cytoplasms. So that's a mesenchymal type tumor. Here these are epithelial cells. We have lots of cytoplasm, varying sizes, which isn't uncommon for epithelial cells. We have a well-defined cytoplasmic border. So these are epithelial cell tumors. Tumor tracking. So talking about grading, um, if an animal is getting routine treatment for a tumor or they have, they tend to have recurrence of tumors, it's important to track them and grade them throughout the clinic. And this is the role of the veterinarian. It's not definitely not up to us, but we can assist in the development of this grading. So grading the tumors helps predict tumor behavior and prognosis. It's defined microscopically on histopathology. Low grade is well differentiated tissue structure, slow cell division, minimal tissue invasion of normal tissue. That sounds silly. High grade undifferentiated tissue structure, rapid cell division, so we're seeing a lot of those abnormal mitotic figures, and aggressive invasion of normal tissue. Staging is what, sorry, so just going back one, I lied there. Grading is done by the histopathologist. Staging is done by the veterinarian according to the physical characteristics of the tumor and the diagnostic test results. It's the TNM system. So T is the features of the tumor at the primary site. N is the regional lymph node involvement. And M is metastasis. Okay, and it's a scale of 1 to 10. These are just some early warning signs for cancer. I think there are, honestly are a thousand clinical signs of cancer in an animal, especially of a malignancy. But it's good to know what to look for. And it doesn't mean that every sick animal that comes to your clinic has cancer. Don't start diagnosing them as having cancer. But really, as an RVT, I hate to say it, but you start getting to know who has cancer. And it's those, <laughs> you know, the old lab that comes in, it's had rapid weight loss, it's lost a lot of the muscle rapidly. Uh, not eating is a big sign that something's going on. Sores that don't heal, okay, could be definitely cancerous. 
bleeding or discharge from any body openings. Now, nasal, uh, honestly, <laughs> with nasal discharge, if there's blood coming from the nose, then it tends to be either something infectious or mycotic, trauma, or cancer. <laughs> I hate to say it, but that's from experience. Offensive odors, especially with cats or oral tumors and dogs. Persistent lameness or stiffness. Swelling in a specific limb also is a big indicator of um, and maybe a lymphoma. Difficulty urinating, difficulty breathing, or defecating. Those are all signs of what could be cancer. But again, we can't just look at an animal and decide absolutely they have cancer. We have to go through all of our testing. Normally it's x-rays, blood work, and then uh, deductive, finding out where that possible cancer could be. All right, lastly, we have the criteria of malignancy. And this is what we look for cytologically based on nuclear and general forms. So nuclear criteria of malignancy are the best for saying absolutely this is malignant. I have found three criteria of nuclear uh, malignancy. I'm pretty happy that this is a, a malignant tumor. I'm not happy about it, but I'm pretty sure. Um, for any criteria of malignancy, we're looking at the cells and we're looking at abnormalities within those cells. And you require between three to five criteria before commenting on suspected malignancy. You only need three criteria if you're using nuclear criteria alone. If you're looking at general forms as well as nuclear, three to five. All right. And we always say suspected, we don't diagnose. So this is your form that indicates all the criteria of malignancy. And you may have a sample that has every single one of those criteria present. Okay? We'll go through those. So nuclear to cytoplasm ratio, I think you need to know, I know that you need to know what is normal for that type of cell before you can determ determine if that's abnormal or normal nuclear to cytoplasm ratios. Okay, macronucleoli, if the nucleoli are greater than um, 5 micrometers, micro, uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I'm starting to fade out a little. So using your red blood cell as an indicator, if your nucleoli are the same size or approximately the same size as your red blood cells, then that would be considered a macronucleoli. Pleomorphism is the change in shape of the cells, so that's a fairly typical spindle cell. This is an abnormal spindle cell. It has expansive cytoplasm, which is not normal for that cell. Anisocytosis, you'll remember this from red blood cell morphology. It's a variation in, um, oh, my cat is screaming. Okay, in the, the cells, oops, sorry, let me go back one. Okay, Anisa, sorry, going back to this one different sizes in the cells. So this is an epithelial tumor and it has a variation in the size of the cells. So again we're getting that giant nucleus in a giant cell but not as normally as epithelial cells age. Their nucleus shrinks and their cytoplasm grows bigger. Nuclear molding is uh, in a way a form of abnormal mitosis but it's when two nuclei are stuck together within a cell. Abnormal mitosis and nuclear molding. Okay. And looking back again at this specific one, gosh, what did we have? So this was a a lung specimen, I suppose. No, this wasn't. Wrong slide. Sorry, but looking at this one, so thinking about our criteria of malignancy, we have anisocytosis, so different sizes of cells. We have anisokaryosis, macrokaryosis high and vari variable nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. We have multinucleation or binucleation, which would be more towards that. And then we have nuclear molding, where they're completely stuck together. And we have coarse nuclear chromatin pattern. So numerous, numerous criteria of malignancy within that specific sample. And then just as a general, there are some more reliable and less reliable criteria of malignancy. Prominent or mul multiple nucleoli 
if the numbers are not variable, that's less reliable. Multinucleation displaying all nuclei, nuclei as the same size, less reliable. Normal mitosis, more reliable nucleoli that are different sizes in the same cell. Multinucleation, the nuclei displaying anisokaryosis, so various sizes. And striking cellular anisokaryosis. Okie dokie, so that is our criteria of malignancy and our neoplasia PowerPoint. It's a long one, and we'll talk about it again in class, but do use this to reference back. And thank you for putting up with my cats and my easily distractible self. <laughs>